Processing Universe. It's Hank Balch. You are listening to the Unbroken Podcast Series, sponsored by Richard Wolf, talking about all things care and handling of endoscopes. This is episode four, scoping in quality, and we're going to be talking about visual inspection of these endoscopes, what it looks like, when it should happen, what the challenges are, and how to build a successful, sustainable inspection program. We've got a great lineup of panelists joining us today. So hang with us and we'll be right back for this interview. All right, we're back in studio here, episode four, scoping in quality. And we got some names that you're going to recognize from previous episodes back in studio with us today. We got Bobby Gaskins, Nicholas Day, and Garrett Capel. We're going to be picking up a theme that we talked about a little bit, y'all, last episode on the topic of inspection for these scopes and just the broad category, but also we're going to be getting into some specifics about what it looks like from just the day-to-day role and responsibility for inspecting these scopes, some of the challenges or obstacles out there, and then how we've been doing a couple of episodes here. We're going to be sharing some success stories, so what it looks like to get it right and to keep it right in a sustainable model in your endo department or your sterile processing department. So we got a lot to throw at you here in the next 20 to 25 minutes. But just in case, this is the first episode that folks are jumping into in the series. I do want to start again with a quick intro around the table. Garrett, we'll start first with you today. Yeah, sure. I am Garrett Capel, the marketing manager for reprocessing at Richard Wolf. So I handle all of the product management and creative marketing, creative marketing strategy for the reprocessing products at Richard Wolf. And met Bobby and Nick for the first time at the National HSPA meeting, but we're all native to the Cleveland area. So I'm looking forward to working with them in the future. All right. Welcome back, Garrett. Let's go next to you, Nick. Good morning. Um, Nicholas Day, I am a regional manager at University Hospitals uh, for sterile processing, high-level disinfection, and equipment management. So it's been a blast working here for about the last five plus years and also sit on the board with my colleague Bobby on the the line here as a, a vice president for that chapter for about a decade. We got a conference coming up we're excited about, so look forward to the talk today. Awesome. Awesome. Welcome, Nick. And let's go to you, Bobby. Hi, everyone. My name is Bobby Gaskins. I am the operations manager of sterile processing for the Cleveland Clinic's Ambulatory Surgery Centers. As Nick mentioned, I sit on the board of our Northeastern Ohio Central Service Association, thankfully serving as president this year and happy to be here. Uh, so, Bobby, let's go maybe first to you in this uh, kind of overview of the topic today. When we say scope inspection, we mean something by that. And we mean something by that. Maybe that's even different from the normal instrument inspection. When I say normal, you know, maybe you can define that too. But what is different or what does scope inspection mean to you? What should we be thinking categorically if we were to sit a group of students down in front of us and say today, this is the topic that we're going to cover? Yeah, at a high level, I would define scope inspection, you know, it's inspection is visual always when we're looking at any instrument, whether it's a scope, whether it's, you know, an orthopedic item that we have, we're using our eyes, but we're also using tools when it comes to really most items in SPD these days, but especially endoscopes and rigid scopes as well. When we're doing that visual inspection, you don't only want to look at the outside, but you want to look at the inside. We want to make sure that internal mechanical elements are working inside. There's no residual bio burden or damage inside of the scopes as well. Distal tip is super important. There's just a lot that goes into scopes in general when it comes to inspection outside of just looking at it. You got to feel it. You got to touch it. You got to use some tools. And I look forward to getting into that with you guys deeper. Yeah. You know, when speaking to students, many times I say you got to use all of your senses, except for maybe your sense of taste. You can save that one for later. But yeah, the look, (laughs) yeah, yeah, the look, the feel, 
the sound of things, if you've got some clicks, maybe, and we'll kind of get into some of that, even depending on the chemical process, et cetera, sometimes you can even smell some things. You're just like, uh, you know, it shouldn't quite smell like that. And getting into that inspection stage, like you said, you know, it is primarily visual. That's the main sense. But yeah, you bring up a great point. It's not only visual. And I've smelled a stinky scope. I don't know if you've ever okay. smelled Okay. <laughs> well, yes. But we had a stinky scope, like where we were opening the cabinet and you got hit with the smell. And we had to go through and figure out where was the smell coming from. And right. it was a damaged internal channel where there was a buildup. So you got to use your nose. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know, that's such a powerful point, too, and a powerful smell. <laughs> but, <Yes. laughs> um, Smells are representative of something and you don't get a bad smell without some bad bugs that are still present. And then, you know, using that again to kind of identify where that gap in the process or where the design issue is or where the damage issue is, I guess, critical example, right, of using that and then going that next step and saying, okay, but what's wrong? I know in the last episode, Nick, you brought up that this type of inspection actually happens at different stages and different places in the workflow. Can you speak to that a little bit as you're kind of setting the stage? Like I know we say scope inspection, but where is that happening in the average department and in the workflow? Sure. I'll make sure we hit that, 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 those three letters um, here early in the call um, <laughs> following the IFU. There you um, go. Six so, minutes yeah. this time. <laughs> make, make sure we're throughout any of these inspections and make sure we're referring back to the IFU of the specific scope model you're, you're working with and see what the recommendations within those IFUs are to how to inspect it, type of tools to inspect it with, and you know, so on and so forth. When we get into, you know, the different areas where scope can be inspected, obviously it would start at the point of use on the operating room in the operating room and the procedure when they're pulling that sterile item out of the tray and they should be doing that initial inspection to make sure that it's going to be safe and proper to be used on the patient. And then the same thing when they're done with it, before they're putting it back into the transport cart to go back to decon, they should be inspecting to make sure there's no damage throughout the case to tag it and, you know, communicate that to the team down there that we need to do, you know, some corrective action with it. Once it hits decon, you know, just going through the flow here, decon TAM tech should be pulling that out. And first thing they should be doing is visual inspection on it. And then again, following those IFU steps through the cleaning process, inspection, some tools they can use in decon would be, you know, obviously visual uh, naked eye, but also we have fluoroscopes, we have microscopes, digital and manual microscopes at the sink side. And then there are obviously brushes can be used as an inspection tool. So whether you feel like there's a stain or bio burden, debris, something on a scope that, you know, may be more in depth than just bio burden, it could be rust or it could be, you know, pitting or something like that. And a brush could help identify those sort of things. So once you get it through the decontam process, it can work in its way, you know, over to the assembly area. We have some more robust, you know, technologies that can exist out there. The digital age is coming and we have even things like artificial intelligence that are coming into play where it can help identify what something may be on a specific device, whether it's bio burden or if it's a part of the scope. Those tools can help technicians down the line. So, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's great. You know, you brought up previous to the AI part, you brought up maybe a low tech tool, and that's the brushes. What's interesting about that, too, is, you know, a lot of these instructions for use, at least the older ones, used to say to brush until clean. And I remember uh, when I was trained as a new technician, you know, that was a really important step in this process of as you, because you see that brush, you know, coming through the lumen or the cannula to say, hey, this is still dirty. So I don't know what all's in there, but no, I'm not done yet. And so that inspection piece, you know, that was a key to inspection because you couldn't at that point, you didn't necessarily have boroscopes and whatnot to be able to see in. And so that was our eyes is what's happening on the brush. But as you said, you know, we have additional tools today than just that brushing tech. But I think that's still a critical metric on, hey, is our cleaning doing what it should be doing by design? So I appreciate you calling that out. 
So on the manufacturer side, Garrett, as you're bringing these devices into hospitals for the first time or to departments or maybe like next generation devices, you know that there's a responsibility and expectation for this visual inspection. Where do you start when you're maybe training teams for the first time or again, you know, introducing teams to devices that they haven't seen before with maybe different nuances of that device than maybe they're used to for previous generations. What do you make sure and cover when you're introducing that? Sure. So depending on the device, we'll just use the flexible scopes, for example. The first thing we're going to train them to do is obviously visual inspection of the outside. So you want the scope to lay completely flat, make sure the distal tip isn't bending on its own in any certain direction. And then you're going to want to test the deflection of the device. So use the uh, uh, I always forget the name of it, but I call it the thumb trigger, but that's a horrible name for it. But to uh, <laughs> deflect the scope back and forth in both directions, test the deflection. And then also make sure you don't see any visual tears or anything like that in any part of the scope. And then also towards the handle, sometimes during cleaning, depending on the cleaning motion they're using when cleaning the scope, we want to make sure we're checking the part where the scope actually connects to the handle of the device as well. So those are a couple initial things with the flexibles. And then also with our semi-rigids and our rigids, one of the main things would be to actually hold it up towards a light and look through it. And then knowing what you're looking for is if you see a certain amount of speckles or pepper that it looks like. So things like that. And then as far as visual with the rigids and semi-rigids, checking to make sure it's not too bent because sometimes they can get bent during operations or any noticeable cracks or like Nick talked about rust or anything like that. Garrett, I got a follow-up question here for you. You mentioned that light, the testing of the light transmission through these scopes. And I know in in recent years, you know, probably five, six, seven years now, we've seen some devices come on the market to test that light transmission. What are your thoughts on that? Is the tech there yet? Do you see some gaps or opportunities in there to improve that? Because that is one of those tools like boroscopes that is seeking to take us one step further in our ability to inspect. Yep. So the the most common one that I've seen is a, it's almost like a flashlight that attaches to the light source of the scope. That one, to me, seems to work the best. And then outside of that, I haven't seen too many others in in use. I don't know, Bobby or Nick could probably talk to other ones that they might use, but that's what I'm most familiar with. That's what I'm most familiar with as well, Garrett. Um, That like flashlight that you can hook on there, it's it's perfect. Yeah, it works great. It's easy to... So we've actually taken taken it a step step further. We acquired an old light source from the operating room to place in our departments where we can hook up a light cable directly to the scope. So we actually have that the output of a light source that we can check not only light cables, but also the light source within the, the scope. Oh, so it's not always the scope's problem, Nick. Is that what you're saying? Mm-hmm. That's right. <laughs> but yeah, you know, you bring up a great point. I know that fluorescent, you know, like looking at trying to find the best angle light, you know, to yeah. wherever you are inspecting <laughs> to try to do that light source is probably not the best case in the area. I know it works and, you know, we got to do what we got to do. But yeah, having that light source in hand or an actual, you know, light source like Nick's team sounds like has used, that seems you're just getting that much closer to so what that clinician would be seeing in the room. And obviously that's what we want to test for. So that's great insight. I, I think sharing yeah. the trick, tricks of the trade too. A lot of the, old, the, old, the OGs in the business know like looking at a light post, you know, if you see those black spec dots within the, the fibers, you know, you have, you know, dying fibers within that light post and more times than not throughout the scope. So those are kind of little, little pieces that, sometimes aren't trained to newer technicians and hopefully get shared amongst the veteran, more veteran techs to, on how to do those types of little shortcut inspections. So, Bobby, I know this is kind of already flowing under this conversation, but maybe let's take a step back quickly and say, what's the impact of a high-functioning scope inspection process or program? What does that mean for the patient, your surgeons, for your budget? 
it's a positive impact all around. It positively impacts your budget. It positively impacts the patient. It also positively impacts your team. When you get them into that routine and you have an inspection program and everyone knows each step, it's not a free for all and it's not everyone's job. And because when it's everyone's job, it's no one's job and then it ends up being missed. So it's just an overall benefit that, you know, comes back to us in SPD, gives to the patient and overall gives to the, the enterprise. At the end of the day. Right. You know, these devices, they undergo, it's kind of a tough life, you know, to be a medical device, right? You got a lot of responsibility on your shoulders, you know, life and death here, you're trying to heal. And then you're just getting banged around and you're getting drowned every single day. And you got chemicals mixed in and you got more chemicals thrown at you on the sterilization or the disinfection front. And so it, it's, it's a tough it's a tough life. It's a hard knock life for these things. And yet, you know, this stage that we're talking about, this inspection stage is the one chance for us to say, okay, buddy, how you doing in there? Are you hanging in there? Okay. Are you meeting all those expectations? <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. You need, uh, you need a vacation. You need to go to the spa, you know, and get some repair here done. And, you know, Nick, though, it's not just about the device. And you brought this up on the last episode for the decontamination stage when you talked about the need to have adequate staging prior to manual cleaning, like not just the corner of the sink. And then you also talked about, you know, staging after manual cleaning. And I'm wondering, Nick, if you can speak to this inspection conversation. We've talked about the tools and we talked about kind of the place in the workflow, but obviously you need the space and space is such a rare commodity. And if anything, you know, having space to adequately inspect, that seems like it tends to just fall kind of to the bottom of the barrel in planning and strategy and whatnot. And so how should you think about this if you're a department leader, if you're a technician kind of looking around your department and saying, hey, like we've got plenty of space to process. But then coming to this inspection stage, how have you worked through those challenges? Yeah. So, you know, it depends whether you're on the, the decon side or the assembly side for starters. So like I'm starting a decon, I see a lot of techs myself when, if I'm in, working in the, in the mix, we have a boroscope in decon and I firmly believe that that should be the first line of defense to use it before it makes it to assembly and potentially contaminate another technician or, or anything along those lines. So our inspections are mostly being done we have a dedicated hand wash sink for all of our manually cleaned items. So we're fortunate with that. So most of that inspection is done at the sink. I, I see techs and myself, I've taken or items out of the cart and I'll put them on top of our case cart. And I'll do that initial inspection just to make sure something isn't out of place or visual, you know, quick visual inspection before I start my cleaning and routine inspection. And that top of a case cart generally is a very nice flat surface area. I'll take my manually clean items out first and kind of use that surface, working surface to do that initial inspection and then take them over to the sink. When you get over to the assembly side, we generally have more robust areas to set up and have the boroscope or digital inspections. Well, again, fortunate enough, we have six prep and pack workstations at both of the sites I, I lead and I've acquired digital microscopes at every single workstation. So any tech working at any station has the exact same inspection capabilities when they're working. So I think that standardization to where if like one station's tied up with one device that can only be used, then the other person's left in the dark when they have to go process multiple trays. So I think it's key to yeah set up that consistency or have some type of standard consistent method that's accessible to everybody. So Bobby, you know Nicholas just brought up standardization and he brought up consistency and you know maybe the phrase that's underlining all that or the word that's underlining all that is um, training. And so I want to spend a couple of moments here before we move to a close talking about the need and and the obstacles even to training teams to effectively, consistently, in a standardized fashion, do what we're talking about today, which is 
inspect all of our devices every time they come through the workflow at the same level. So everyone's doing it just as good as the other one. It's not, you know, oh, Johnny's working today. So, you know, fingers crossed, nothing <laughs> that goes by Johnny. How do you approach that from the training, the orientation, the staffing side to make sure that you're not missing any gaps in this process that we're so focused on building well? Yeah, and for me firsthand, I I have a struggle with training in ambulatory surgery. We have small teams and they're lean, so they're busy and it's difficult to have that preceptor with a person the whole time, but we've acknowledge the importance of that and we make the time to do it. So we, with the enterprise, Cleveland Clinic is an enterprise. They have an education team, which is really great and supportive. So we have leveraged that education team that we have. When we have new caregivers, they go down to main campus for what they call the education cohort. And during that cohort, they are put through paper testing, they're put through visual learning and hands-on learning. So they do that aspect, then they come back to us with at least some background, and we follow that process through. And we have a dedicated preceptor that follows them through the entire process in our department, and endoscopy is a piece of that. And thankfully, our process has been standardized to where each caregiver knows the steps they're put in front of them. They can visually see them. We also leverage utilizing SPM, which is a tracking system. And utilizing tracking is huge. It does 95% of the work for you. And it also walks you through the process. So utilizing the tools that we have, the resources that we have, and then having our frontline caregivers take it serious and know you can't just leave them alone for an hour and a half and go take your lunch. Like You have to stay by the hip to answer those questions, walk them through the process, and explain the why behind what we're doing. Because you can teach somebody how to clean an endoscope all day, but if they don't understand why they're brushing that channel, why is it important to check the boot? Why do we check you know, the fiber optic cables and ensure that they can visualize? Every piece is important and you can't miss a step. So having it structured, having it visual for the visual learners, for those that like to listen, having that option of verbally walking someone through. You have to have all pieces and you also have to understand how people learn. Not everyone's going to train the same way or grasp things the same way. So engaging with that person on is what you're seeing making sense? Do you understand the anatomy of an endoscope? Do you know how to hold the endoscope? Those tiny pieces make the job so much harder because if you're fumbling over here, you don't even know how to carry it. That's step number one. Hmm. I feel like people who have pet snakes are just <laughs> naturally you know, better at holding these endoscopes <laughs> because they got something wiggling that's you know long and whatnot and just doesn't want to agree with you, but you also don't want to drop it. And so they just tend to be specially gifted. I don't know. Yep. You know, you brought up a phrase that has come up a couple of times already in this series that I know will continue to come up in the remaining episodes that we have. And it's I guess you kind of mentioned it in a context of learning styles, but, you know, creatively educating, coming to this question, if it's visual education, like you said, if it's written education, if it's just kind of the do show tell model, it confronts those different technicians wherever they are in the process, but it also doesn't leave them there. And that's kind of what I want to wrap on this part particular interview today. And Garrett, I'll kind of give you the last word for us. Even this podcast series is a good example of what Bobby was saying in uh, creatively confronting our technicians, whether they're new in the orientation stage, or maybe they've been reprocessing scopes for years and years. But, you know, technology has changed. Guidelines have changed. Even the tools that we can use to inspect has changed. So, Maybe this is kind of a weird question to end this interview, but I'm going to ask you anyways, you know, what was your vision for this conversation when you sat out and said, hey, we want to bring this conversation together in a podcast series like this to support the industry to do things better when it comes to scope, to capture all the fallouts for damage, to capture all the opportunity for better inspection? What was your initial vision when you sat down and mapped this out? Yeah, my main vision, I guess, was just to really gain feedback directly from people who are in it every day. I mean, 
knowing where their struggles are at, where they need help, and then also learning their process. That helps us get them the tools and resources that they need. I know yesterday I talked about providing the right tools to help our customers succeed. And I think that's the most important thing I was hoping to get out of all this is having great conversation and also learn and learn how we can help even more than we already are. All right. Well, you've heard the vision. You've heard already we're in four episodes of a six-part series here. So we're not done yet to fulfill this vision of, you know, hearing feedback, but then also giving insights like you've been hearing already in this episode of scope inspection and previous episodes from scope transport, decontamination, et cetera. But wait, there's more. So if you like what you hear and make sure to subscribe to the channels across Beyond Clean, you can track these folks down through LinkedIn. We'll also have links and such in the write-ups. And yeah, I want to thank the panel again for a terrific conversation today. Thank you, Hank. Thank you. Thanks, Hank. All right, so that's going to do it for episode four, scoping in quality visual inspection of endoscopes with our fantastic panel discussion today. We covered a lot of aspects of inspection and the dirty side on the clean side, even inspection at the point of view. So, so glad that Nicholas brought that up in the interview today. But we're going to pick up that stream of inspection and, and talk about one topic that we didn't cover in this episode in the next episode, episode five. And we're going to pick up that interview talking about residual tests, these protein tests, these other tests that we're using to say, hey, did the process that we just put this scope through do what we thought it was going to do? So if you're interested in that topic, we'd love to have you back here for episode five coming out next. But until then and now, we want to remind you, just like we do every week at Beyond Clean, to keep fighting dirty. Oh, 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 oh,